It's the weekend and you have financial questions that need answering. That can only mean one thing. It's time for Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Welcome, welcome. It's the Jill on Money Show. We are here taking the mystery out of your financial life. You know how we do that? We answer your questions. All you need to do is go to the website, jillonmoney.com, and click on the Contact Us button. But if you think that you might need more significant and personalized financial planning, we encourage you to check out our sponsor, Facet Wealth. Facet Wealth provides financial advice that is critical to your well-being, and they do it regardless of how much money you have to invest. So that's kind of cool. So you can check out Facet Wealth by visiting cbsaudio.com slash Jill, and you'll get two months free off your first year of financial planning. Right now, we're starting the show with Patrick, who's on the line from Virginia. What brings us together today? So I have a um, uh, two children. 17 year old and a 14 year old. My 17 year old is a rising senior in high school. Uh, and then my 14 year old is a rising freshman in high school. And so uh, obviously, or maybe not obviously, but my, my 17 year old daughter is looking at colleges and we are uh, hopeful that she will uh, enter college next fall or a year from now. So I've since a very young age, we've been uh, contributing to a 529 really for for both children, but more more importantly, or more uh, upcoming is my daughter's 529. And so I've had it invested pretty, uh, I'll say aggressively in a 529. Mm-hmm. And the uh, I looked at it in January and tried you to felt, You probably <laughs> felt very good in January. <laughs> like, you know, let me look at the year end <laughs> statement. Let me, oh, look, as of December 31st, I feel good. And now if you look at it, not feeling quite as good, right, Patrick? That's correct. Not feeling quite as good. Um, Tell and, me, wait a second, before we go on, I just want to know, give me a couple of details. In sure. the 17-year-old's 529 plan, how much money is there? Today, it's at 90000 Okay. And the 14-year-old's? So he's at about 50000 One other thing to mention is that we uh, established a, an IRA in my wife's name that we are also using as a – or intending to use as a college fund as well. How old um, is your wife? She is uh, 53. So you would want to use that for the 14-year-olds? That's correct. Mm-hmm. Okay. And how much is in there? Uh, 40000 40, are we thinking rising senior? I know looking at colleges, since you're from Virginia, is there any possibility I get to go to like UVA? So the plans are that uh, she goes to a state unit, state school. So mm-hmm. UVA or Virginia Tech or, or any other Virginia state schools. Mm-hmm. Uh, our expectation or what we have kind of committed to her is that we would pay an equivalent of a state school. And if she wanted to go to a private school or out of state, that would be on her. Okay. What does it cost to go to one of your state schools a year when you say the equivalent of, so what's the number? So the number that we were shooting for, <laughs> I'll say 17 years ago, the number is different today. Yes. Um, but uh, so we were originally envisioning about a hundred thousand or to 120 in that range. Mm-hmm. Uh, UVA today is uh, about 32 with tuition and room and board. Uh, the other Virginia schools are a little bit less expensive, but but that's. But the, you're not so far off when you said a hundred to. You're, in other words, you weren't right. that far off. Okay. Right. So I guess my my question is is right now that five twenty nine and really all of the five twenty nines, including the IRA, are pretty aggressively invested in mm-hmm. in mutual funds, and I just don't know what to when I should start making them less aggressive now uh-huh. is it too late that i missed my window or I, you, you, know, hear mark, you hear you hear mark talercio chuckling in the background <laughs> i do no oh, it's not nice tell us a little bit more patrick about what's going on so first of all so your wife is making an ira contribution is she working also is she making that using a spousal ira is she what's her the income right now in the household she works part time. Uh, she makes a small amount. Uh, combined, we we make about 160. How's your cash flow on that 160 to 170 a year? We're pretty comfortable. Okay, all right. And do you contribute to a retirement account? Oh yes. And how old are you? Uh, I'm 51. 
Okay. And are you contributing 27,000? Is you know, are you maxing out with the catch up contribution? And I'm not. So I, I contribute, um, 10%, 11% totally okay. on a year. I have a 401k in my work. Uh, so I get the match plus some, and, uh, and then of course my wife does the, the RAR. And she, is she doing the whole thing like 6,000 or 7,000 right now? She does 400 a month into that. Okay. And what about money that's just in the bank? Boring emergency reserve fund. Uh, so we have about, I'm going to look up them. So we have about 43 as a reserve or as an emergency fund. And any brokerage account, any anything kicking around like, oh, I thought this was fun when markets were higher. <laughs> no, I'm not that brave. What about the house? Tell us about where do you live and how much it's worth. So I'm in a, uh, I have, I own a home. Uh, I've got a mortgage of about, it's about 90 left on it. Home's oh. worth about 320. The mortgage interest rate? Oh, it's 2.7 something. So you're not making any extra payments on that, right? No, it was a 15 year note. And so we've got, uh, I think, six or seven years left on it. Wow. You are really close to the end. That's amazing. So that's interesting though, because it sort of looks like, I don't know what your mortgage payment is right now. Do you have an idea? Just just the mortgage, the principal and interest, not all the uh, other stuff. Uh, 1800 I mean, so it's interesting because by the time the your your youngest is in, you know, sort of finishing up exactly. college, you got a nice little extra moolah coming in that can help float some of the difference, right? That was the vision. Yeah. Okay. You're happy at work. Like life is good. You're comfortable there, and you are uh, secure there, or as secure as one could be at this point in the universe. I would say as secure as one can be at this point. You know, oh, okay, great. And how much is in the 401k total right now? Let's see, 1.4. Is your intention to just keep working? You're happy? Like we're going to, we got to get little, little guy through college. So that sounds to me like at least seven or eight years that you would have in front of you, right? That's correct. I'm, okay. I, my, my thought is, and it's a long way away, so lots can change between then and now, but my thoughts are at 60. Phase out. Which, all right. Phase out is really, let's not go, I'm not even thinking, 60 is a nice goal, but I just want to be clear that like everyone who says to me 60, 58, I know that you're all thinking you can tap into that retirement account, but that's a long time that you have to finance your retirement. You know, you could live for 35 years after that. So you're a hundred percent in stocks right now in uh, the uh, 529 plans? Yes. Mutual funds. Mm-hmm. Well, and we so have I, a year. I have Go two on. questions. Is, is yeah. One is, what, do I move stuff now? And then two is, what do I do with the contributions going forward? So right now, we still contribute to all three of those college funds. The yeah. two, it's a 200, 200, and then 400. So 200 yeah. each to the 529s and then 400 to the IRA. So you know, do I continue with that kind of breakdown or do I change my thoughts? And mm-hmm. if I don't have enough in the, my daughter's 529, do I just cash flow it or do I, I, I don't know what I can do with the well, younger I would, kids I, 529. Yeah, I would probably, I'd probably steal a little from the younger ones 529 because I think you'll have some time to make up. We'll get back to Patrick in just a minute. You are listening to Jill on Money. Do I invest here? Should I put my money there? Jill Schlesinger can help you. Back to Jill on Money. You're back. It's Jill on Money. We are answering financial questions. You can field those questions by going to jillonmoney.com and click the Contact Us button. Let's get back to Patrick from Virginia. Mark, should... Patrick and his wife free and now we're we are exactly one year away from needing money and we don't need all of it but I would suggest that at the very least of the 90 I feel like a third of it needs to come out and be safe so that we have year one taken care of Mark what do you think for sure one year needs to be like in cash my initial thought was okay you got the 90,000 and then you got the IRA and that takes care of child number one 
And then I would take basically four, six, so eight hundred dollars. You put how much you putting into the IRA monthly? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait a second, wait a second. Let's just revise that because they can't get the IRA until the wife turns fifty nine and a half. Don't forget. Uh, there might be an education provision. I'm not sure. I think there might be. Oh, oh yeah, right. Oh, uh, is that what you were thinking, Patrick, for um, using your IRA for education? Or do you think you would wait until she was 59 and a half? I didn't even know there was an education provision. So, <laughs> so I'm my this up right now. Hold on a second. <laughs> yeah, I'm almost positive there is. You avoid a penalty for sure. Right. So if you take out the money for a retirement, you would avoid the 10% early withdrawal, but you have to pay tax on it. Which they're going to have to do anyway. Yes. Uh, well, not necessarily. I mean, yes, they're going to have to pay tax on it. Yes, that's it. But the penalty is the one. I don't know. Like, why don't we just, why don't we put year one in cash with the other money? So if 30 is in cash, okay, now the rest of the money, uh, the remaining 60, I feel it should be less risky. Do you agree with that? I mean, like we have to go into like a stock and bond. Like there has to be like half and half, I think, of the remaining. Like so 30 cash, 30 bond, 30 stock is what I'm thinking. At this point, I don't think it should be half and half. I would be more conservative. Where do you want to go? I would probably have a 30 stock and 70 bond at this point. I mean, they need that money. I know. The money's going to be spent one way or the other. And it's going to be spent like in some short order. And what if we stop putting new money in and stockpile that cash? So that's what we really need to do. So you said it's 800 a month. Is that right? Uh, 800 is the total for all three funds. Right. Okay. So let's say the 800 a month just goes into your emergency reserve fund. Okay. So now that in the next year, that 800, we now have, you know, it's nice because we'll have like 10 grand saved. So now your emergency reserve will be 53. So then you pay for year one in a year from now, if you do, I'm not, you know, I, Mark, I can't believe I'm going to say this, but I actually think it's like, I think they're going to be okay. Okay. Here's what I think you should do. I think you can either, do you feel like, are you anxious about this right now? You want to roll the dice a little bit? Cause I've got some backup plans for you if you want. So I, I would say I'm not anxious. Uh, I'm also, you know, I'm thinking that, um, you know, she's going to be in college for four years at least. And so yeah. that's a five year window for the, you know, for the back. That's what I'm thinking. Cash. That's what I'm thinking. So that's why I think, Mark, I can't believe I'm going to go more aggressive than you. You're going to make the decision, your final decision, Patrick. We advise and you decide, as my friend Dennis Morton at Peloton likes to say, if I did 30 in cash, 30 bonds and 30, I'm talking about 1,000, uh, 30 bonds and 30 stocks. Then year two, I'm hopeful that year two is actually, we're going to just pull half of it is going to be from your emergency reserve fund slash cash flow. And the other half will pull out of the account. And then that we basically have to revisit this every year. We literally have to, like, I need to hear from you. Like, you need to be scaling the risk back. Whatever you think you need to spend a year in advance is what you must have in cash, either in your emergency reserve fund or you got some crazy ass bonus and that was awesome, whatever it is, right? You must have that freed up in cash. Now, for the other two accounts, the 529 for our rising freshman and the IRA, those also have too much risk. So 60-40 or 50-50 in both the rising freshman's 529 and the wife's IRA. Because all of this money is going to be spent within eight years or not eight, eight. Yeah, it's about eight years, right? The worst case scenario, the wor- like, oh my God, what if, what if, what if? You know what? There are things you can do. Number one, you can borrow from your 401k if you had to, to just come up with some cash. You're going to have the house paid off. You're going to save that money. That money's going to be used for cash flow. If you had to in a pinch, you could get a home equity line of credit and quickly, you know, have that for a little bit, pay it down. You got money. It's just a question of, you know, where we access it from. In general, you learned a painful lesson, which is you don't wait around for the market to take a big bite out of your retirement or your college fund. So what you need to do is everyone listening, if you think you need money within, say, two years, that's when you like, ding, 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 I need to reallocate. I need to pull the risk down and free up the cash I need now. And what is your downside? Let's say that let's go back a year. Let's say it was a year prior. And, you know, what would happen is at the end of 2020, you might have said to me, I'm going to need this money in a couple of years. What should I do? And I'd say, you're going to 
downshift. You're going to have a lower level of risk. And then you're, you'd be mad at me because in 2021, stocks would have gone up and you'd call me back and be pissed. And you'd be like, why'd you tell me to do that? I could have made so much money, blah, 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 blah. So that's what happens when in a bull market, you fool yourself. Okay. So there's real rules around this uh, that will keep you out of trouble, but you have to be willing to forego the upside in order to make this work. So everyone listening, Patrick's case is instructive. If you know you need money within a year or two, you that money sits in cash. But that is also the moment that you start to think, I must reallocate because this money is going to be used. The reason why we tell people to downshift their risk as they are approaching retirement is not because they need all of the money at once. It's that you're going to start to need the money and sustaining losses is quite painful when you have no new money coming in. So that's why retirees or pre-retirees should get in the mindset of, I'm willing to give up some of my upside to protect against the downside. So I think you already learned this lesson. I'm not beating the drum. Like you're beating yourself up more than I am, right? I guess. Yes. (laughs) It's not so bad. You have money. So the way I saw it, and Jill, you can knock me down and tell me why not. So I, I was thinking that with the first child's 529 and the IRA, those four years right there are covered. They just need to obviously free some cash up and reallocate and then take the $800 a month and just put that into the other child's 529 going forward until she starts college. And then just re- reallocate at a lower risk level? Yeah, as she gets older, obviously. Even now, they need to start peeling back some of the risk. I mean, I think that that's a that's a perfectly reasonable scenario. I think it reduces the anxiety to know that like we actually are not we have the money in cash and rather than having the money going into that 529 plan, the the younger one's 529 plan. I would just continue to use the 529, you know, it's more tax efficient using that. Because what I'm, okay, so my thought, and this is like, this is good. We haven't actually had this kind of conversation before. I'm thinking that we want to leave the IRA as long as possible. That's my, my theory being that why do I have to put new money to work? I have money there to work. And the money, the cash flow coming in now is what I could use to pay for college. Like I want to delay moving too much around. I'd rather not have to have him pay the tax this second. I mean, $800 a month for the one child for the next several years will probably get them where they need for her as well. I hear you. I'm torn. Patrick, what do you, what do you think? You're the tie-breaking vote. I like that. Uh, I like that idea of what Mark just said. I like the- All right, 800. Mark, lay it out again. Lay it out again. Here's Mark wins on this. I think that Mark is going to be the winner. So Mark, what is the ultimate game plan for Patrick? Lay it out nice and simple. For the folks out there in the Jill on Money community. Well, when I first heard it, that was my initial thought. You got the 90 for the first child. You got the IRA. That basically covers four years of school. You just need to obviously free up a year, put that in cash, and reallocate going forward. You're way too risky, but you know that. So you'll, you'll do that. And then I would just take the $800 a month that you're currently contributing to the three accounts and just redirect that into the one account for your second child. And, and you're going to be doing that for the next several years. I think that'll... That'll eventually get you to the four years of uh, of the cost of college you need, and the mortgage will disappear. All right, I mean, I'm go, I'm game with that. I'm I'm cool with that. If you have a financial question, head on over to JillOnMoney.com, click the contact us button, and while you're there, sign up for the free weekly newsletter. K's, IRAs, refinancing, she covers it all. Back to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. You're back. It's Jill on Money, and we are plowing through the questions. Let's turn to Rob, who is on the line from New England. Hello, Rob. How are you? What's going on? I'm well. Good morning, Jill and Mark. Thank you for taking my call. Of course. What's happening? So I have two questions. And the first is planning around the government pension offset for Social Security. So my wife is fortunate to be a state employee, and she will have a defined pension that is pretty generous, but she does not pay into Social Security. And since we are basically the same age, I am most likely to die before her. And the survivor benefit would be entirely eliminated by the government pension offset. Do. Well, let's talk about some of the numbers and then we can try to figure out the plan. 
So how old are you, first of all? That's, so, that's a big number. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'm 38. My wife is 37. Uh, Rob, how much do you earn right now? So uh, together, my wife and I gross about 170. What is the game plan in terms of her employment uh, with the state? How long do you think she'll stay in the system? So she can retire with her max pension benefit at age 62, which would be 80% um, and include 80% of health insurance. So I believe she's planning to do that. And that would be uh, about in today's dollars, with assuming no promotions, um, 5200 a month is what we would see with the joint survivor benefit. Okay. So that's the joint survivor. So if she, all right, I'm just going to like be blunt about it. Cause so if she is 63 and she drops dead, you're still getting that 1500, $5,200 a month for your life. Correct. Correct. And also the health benefits. And, uh, okay. That's also important. Okay, great. So that's awesome. And she will not be uh, entitled to social security. Correct. Now let's talk about you. What is your game plan in terms of a work uh, you know, work until like 62, 65, 67. What are you thinking? So I'm planning um, to work part time to basically make my Social Security income that I would receive at age 70. So I can delay until then part time from 63 to 70 uh, or maybe more than part time, depending on how I feel. But that that's my game plan. OK. And at 70, what's your Social Security benefit? Uh, at 70 right now, it's 3300 so at your age 70, you claim the 3300 She is not entitled to half of yours because she gets no Social Security. I just want to make sure we get that out there, right? No Social Security at all for your wife. Correct. Okay. So if people are listening, I feel like I want to make sure I always bang that drum. Uh, some places when you work for certain municipalities, there is a Social Security carve out like you don't get it no matter what. Okay. So right now, how much money are you putting away into retirement accounts between the two of you? So she has a, a 457 that she's putting away a, a nominal amount in. There's about 15000 in that right now. I am doing a 6% Roth match with my current employer. So I've got, uh, I just started that position. So I've got about 5000 in there. And I have previous rollovers of 20000 in traditional and 12000 in Roth. And any other money that's invested right now, brokerage account or 529 plans, if you have kids, I didn't know if you have kids or not. Yep. I have two young kids. So we do have 529s. We have about 6,000 in there for them. And our plan for that is we basically put in the the amount to get this, the max out the state income tax deduction. Um, we have a, the mortgage on our house will roll off when our oldest is a senior in high school. So we are planning to cash flow what we are willing to contribute to college um, and let them bear the brunt of the rest. I love that. Okay. How much is the house worth? A house is worth about 550. And so there must be a small ish. How, I don't know how old your kids are, but how, what's the outstanding mortgage balance? So we've got about 120 um, at 3.75% and payments for another 10 years. And how old are the kids? Uh, five and eight. So why just 6% into the retirement account? So until now, we've been pretty heavily hit with daycare expenses. And uh -huh. my youngest is going to be going into kindergarten. So that's rolling off. So I was planning to increase those contributions uh, now that that expense is gone. How much was daycare? Uh, when we had both at the same time, it was 35 a year. Good God. Okay. And then, so what I know, what is rolling off? What do we have available to us in free cash flow once daycare is eliminated? Is a five-year-old going to kindergarten this year? Yes. So we probably have 2000 2500 a month that we could realistically put towards um, uh, retirement. Okay. What about the emergency reserve? How much is in there? Uh, we have 12 months in cash. Okay. Great. No other investment accounts, right? No other investment accounts. And then the only other debt we have is uh, uh, $8,000 left on solar panels, uh, but they pay for themselves. So that's not really a, a concern. Okay. I'm not concerned. Mark, should Rob put all of that $2,000 into his retirement account? I was going to say 1500 a month and then the other 1000 I would open up a brokerage. Yeah, I'm thinking that also. So here's what I, I think that the 1500 a month pops that right into the retirement account. Just like wait till the kindergarten happens and everything is okay because, you know, Sometimes you need a little extra help or whatever, but try to increase it so that you're maxing out your account, your uh, retirement account, and that would be $20,500 this year. 
I mean, you may not get it for this year since half, you know, whatever, seven months is over. But, you know, get on track another $1,500 a month starting in, say, September, October. Okay. Then the extra money, since you do have your 12 month cash stash, I like the idea of starting a non retirement brokerage account, meaning just a plain old joint account between the two of you. Because at this point, you're going you're gonna to start, you know, really, you're going to spend 20 years more, 22, 24 years putting money away at whatever pace you're going to do. Having that pot of money that's already been taxed is going to solve for that question of what do we do about not having as much money because she will not have social security. And I think that's what gives you some flexibility right there. And that will also give you flexibility when you are doing your 63 to 70. But that's really how we plan for it. I mean, the the fact that you don't have social security or she doesn't rather is is not the biggest concern because it does not look to me like you're spending a ton of money. It's hard to tell because your kids are young right now. What if I put a gun to your head, how much money do you need for retirement income? Do you know what that number is? It's about six grand a month is is really comfortable for us. All right. So, I mean, you're going to have that because essentially her pension plus your social security is going to get you there. The only issue you're going to have is coming up with the money that you'll need between 63 and 70. That's really or 62 and seven, whenever you decide to downshift, that's it. And then you're fine. And then the fact that she doesn't get social security is not the biggest deal in the world because you're planning around it just by putting more money into retirement, number one, and number two, having that cash available to you before you reach age 70 so you have some money to spend. And I think that that's, that makes sense. We'll get back to Rob in just a moment. Hey, want to hear something cool? If you go to jillonmoney.com and you ask your financial question, you know what else you can do? You can pre-order the new book. Follow Jill on Twitter and Instagram for more personal finance content. Just use the handle at Jill on Money. Now, back to the show. You're back. It's Jill on Money trying to help you navigate your financial journey. Let's get back on the line with Rob because he's got a question about his mom. Rob, what's question two? I feel like this is the doozy. This is the the piece that is a little more complicated. So my mother is in her early 70s and she lives in a, a resort community, let's say, and she's lived there her entire life and she has zero dollars in retirement savings. Some of that's due to some things I don't necessarily agree with, but the past is the past and we're moving forward. So I'm trying to figure out how to get her you know, stable in her community because I think moving outside that away from her immediate family would be a detriment to her well-being. And eventually she's going to have to stop working, whether it's by choice or by force. Um, and she's going to have to live on her social security, which uh, is only 1600 a month. And right now the uh, mortgage taxes and insurance on her house is uh, just under 2000 a month. So her living cost alone would be blowing her out of the water. So um, we've looked at a few things, looking at reverse mortgages, maybe turning. How much is the house worth? So the house is worth about $1.2 million right now. Because uh, she's in a fancy resort community that's skyrocketed in value. It, What's the outstanding mortgage balance? The outstanding mortgage is 150000 at 4%, and there's 20 years left on that payment. So right now she's working. How much is she earning? She's earning about 60000 a year. Um, wow. So that's she's, great. She's doing really well. Um, but it basically is you know, almost paycheck to paycheck. The expenses where she is are higher. So she's just kind of getting by. So I'm, I'm looking at options. And uh, right now, the one that seems to be the most attractive is for my wife and I to assume the, the mortgage taxes and insurance and essentially have her, you know, gift us the property and we would give her a life estate. Um, and, you know, she could keep any income that the property generated from, you know, renting a room or something like that. So uh, Mark, by the way, there goes my $2,000 a month into his retirement account. Did you just hear that go away? Pop. Goodbye. Goodbye. Uh, Rob, wait a second. I just want to ask a few more questions. Sure. So your mother is in her early 70s and she's working, so she's okay. This sounds like, I don't know if it's a big house or a small house or what have you, but is she able to maintain the house? Like, is there any notion like we should move her out of here? It sounds like she's 
perfectly capable of living on her own right now, right? Yeah. No, she's perfectly capable of living on her own. And the house can be set up so that it's single floor living um, so she can extend the time that she's there. So okay, um, it's not a, it, that's not a concern. We've looked at downsizing. The problem is, is that with the prices cra- so crazy where she is, downsizing would really only lo- unlock, uh, you know, a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars out of the equity she it. has. So it's not worth it. Do you have siblings? I have one sibling. Not a great relationship or okay? No, we have a great relationship. He's just not, uh, you know, not completely out on his own, figured out where he wants to be. So I'm kind of going, okay, I think this is on me to make sure that I can do something. Yeah, but like if this is the only asset, let me just put the, let me just put my hat on representing your brother, okay? It's the only asset. And right now, presumably if your mom it were, you know, to pass away, you would split the house, right? Yep. Okay. So how do we take care of him in this if like it's a little thorny, that's what I would say. It is. So- the the alternative is, you know, if she sold it and moved away from that community, I, I do have concerns and I'm not really confident that that money would last. Um, she's had some previous property sales and previous inheritance that have been eroded completely. And that was money we thought would last a, a good chunk of time. So kind of the the alternative that, that we've been looking at, and we've discussed this at length, is that if she were to sell and move somewhere else, that that money would essentially evaporate and there really would be no inheritance. So what would happen is essentially, would you actually purchase the house from your mom? So I don't have the financial capability to purchase it. So um, I think the cleanest option would be for her to gift it. Um, and whether or not that goes into a trust that is somehow joint beneficiary for my brother and I. Yeah, um, yeah. And then I pay the cost up front and we figure out something on the back end. This is not an asset that I would ever plan to divest from. There's, it's, a, it's a nice place to keep going. You know, eventually, once my mother does pass, this house will probably net you know, $25,000 a year in rental income you know, based on today's dollars. Yeah, at least. Um, you know what I think? I think that this is quite, this is a legal issue. You need a great a state attorney to help paper this. I get where you're going. I mean, there's one part of it that makes me slightly nervous, which is for you personally. Remember our $2,000 of cash flow that you have, let's say two to 2,500. Well, now if you're going to use that to pay the mortgage, maybe she pays, maybe as long as she's still working, maybe you take on the mortgage and she does some other expenses. But like, if you, I I hate to have that 2,000 as a big nut for you. Do you think that if you gave her, a th- if it were $1,000 a month, would it help her at least until she retires to just like stockpile some money? Or do you want to make it cleaner and just be like, I'm taking this whole thing over? I, I really want to make it cleaner. I'm I, If I'm going to get involved and, and put my assets in, I need to protect what's there. Yeah. And, and okay. just gifting her the money is not an option. Okay. So then what I think you have to do is you go meet with a, do you have, do you have a will right now? Do you have an estate attorney that you deal with for you or your mother or anything? Yep, I Anyone? do. I think you talk to this person. I think you lay out exactly what you want to do. Your downside, by the way, is that you will also, if she's gifting you the house, she's gifting you her cost basis, meaning that, you know, if she were to die tomorrow and you inherited the house, you would inherit the date of death valuation of the house, which would mean you inherited at 1.2 million. But since you don't, you're not inclined to sell it anyway, having her cost basis of much lower amount, which I'm sure, you know, Whenever they bought the house, when you know your parents first bought the house was probably a long time ago, but you inherit that cost basis. It's okay. You just have to know that that's the case. Okay, we'll be back in just a moment to conclude our conversation with Rob. If you've got a financial question, this is the place for you. Go to JillOnMoney.com. We'll be right back. You're back. It's Jill on money. Let's get back to Rob. And then what I think has to happen is that you have to have this documented and papered in a way that protects you and your wife, but also to be clear that like you're not screwing your brother out of half of the money. 
And there has to be some way to do that. There is a legal mechanism to do that. I don't know if it's a trust. I don't know how it would work. I don't know if it would be that he is some sort of like partnership in a real estate deal or what have you, or that you're going to owe him a certain amount of money. But a lawyer is going to figure out a way that three interests are served. Mom's is number one, most important, yours financial and your brother's financial. And it has to be that you're all working together for those goals to come together. Agreed. And then luckily we have, you know, the relationship that is going to make that work. So it, there's no okay. contention. There's no, there's no um, animosity. So it should be relatively smooth. It's just a matter of exactly figuring it out. Is there any chance that long term that you would want to live in that house? Did you grow up in that house? I did. And I think long term, um, you know, once the, the principal note is paid off and, and there's some other money that may or may not come in, um, that I would put, you know, a, a guest cottage on there. And that would be somewhere where we could retire to and, you know, still rent out the, the house that is currently there. So there's a lot of upside. Um, yep. And I, th- I think I, th- I think that that's I think that this is actually a weird. Like, yes, it's financial, but it's also legal. Um, Mark, what happens if we can't put two thousand dollars a month into his retirement account? Thank God for that pension. That's exactly right. So here's the deal, dude. Yes. Even if you can just do a little bit more, what I would try to do is every time you get a little raise, even if this deal is done, I would still try to like go from six percent. I'd go to eight percent, try to get to 10 percent see how the cash flow is, see how this deal develops and see whether or not you can slowly increase the amount of money you put in there. If you'd like to join us on the program, all you need to do is go to jillonmoney.com and click the contact us button. the weekend and that can only mean one thing you're listening to jill on money the show that takes the mystery out of your finances here's your host jill schlesinger You're back. It's our number two of the Jill on Money show. And we are here trying to answer financial questions. The way we do that is we ask you to pose those questions through our website, jillonmoney.com. All you need to do is click the contact us button. And while you're there, check out my new book. It's called The Great Money Reset. Change your work, change your wealth, change your life. You can pre-order it right now. Okay, we are starting our number two with Dave from Pennsylvania. Hi, Jill. Thanks for having me on the show. Sure. Uh, I have a question about a mortgage. Okay. Back in 2015, I went through a painful divorce and uh, out of the agreement, I got to keep the house. At the time, I decided to do a 5-1 adjustable rate mortgage. I didn't think I was going to stay in the house much longer. Kind of gave myself a, an artificial deadline of sorts. Mm-hmm. Time heals wounds and after doing some improvements, I'm kind of inclined to stay in the house now. Oh, that's kind of cool. So so it's 2015. You do five years. It's fixed. It must be a pretty low rate. It was fixed for five years and then it adjusts every year after that. How how often is the adjustment? Every year after that. So the, the mortgage was finalized in 2017. So I just hit that five year mark. So what is the new adjustment for this year? It was three and seven eighths and now it's four seven eighths. Okay. How is the jump in rate um, how are you doing that with you? Like, how do you feel about the cash flow around that right now? The full point resulted in a, a hundred dollars a month increase just for interest. Oh, wow. Okay. How much is the house worth? Uh, market value right now is about 300. Okay. And what's the outstanding mortgage balance? 145. And now you're going to stay in it. Now you're like, I want this, right? Uh, for several reasons. It's a good location. Houses don't go f- on sale for on the street very often. Very popular neighborhood. I'm close to everything. The biggest factor is my youngest daughter. We're, we're a couple blocks from all of the schools, middle, uh, elementary school, middle school, high school. Moving would be kind of an inconvenience on top of that. We're not going to let you move. We're going to figure this out. How old is your youngest daughter? She's 
10. How okay. old are you, Dave? I'm 44. 44. And do you have other kids? I have one other kid. She just started high school. Okay. So older daughter in high school. And they're both in public school, right? Correct. Okay, yes. great. Now, as part of the divorce, do you have to pay any alimony or uh, child support or anything like that? Child support, yes. Okay. And that lasts until after college? How, how does it work for you? That's a great question. There is no formal documentation. That's kind of, I don't know how to answer this question. Huh, that's interesting. Because um, usually child support would go until the child reaches age of majority or end of college. That's usually how most documents would put it down there. And obviously, you know, once your older daughter is 22 years old, you're not paying child support anymore. So there won't be anything ongoing there. How much is the total child support right now? It's an interesting question, Jill, because it's kind of, it's not, it's not part of the agreement. It's Oh, I see. You're just giving like, oh, let me help you. Yeah. You're a nice guy. Thanks. <laughs> All right. How much is that? So it's not formal, but how much has that amount been so far-ish? Um, up until last month, it was 600 Now I'm giving her 700 you know, based on gas prices and supply and demand. Okay. And All right. Look, you want her to take care of your kids. You're a good right. guy. Okay. So 700 a month. All right. How much do you earn, Dave? We'll call it a 100 even. Out of that 100 after you pay for the everything, like how much, how's your cash flow? Are you putting money into retirement? What's happening for you? Uh, uh, retirement's about 10%. Okay, uh, great. I got a company match and then I'm adding more on top of that. Okay. How much money's in your retirement plan right now? I, I would, let's say 50,000 right now. That's how I got to keep the house. Oh, you did a quadra. You gave her Correct. a good chunk. Okay, that's fine. So fifty thousand now. How about money in the bank? Just savings. We'll say ten thousand in the bank. Very minimal debt. Okay, like a little credit card that you pay off every month, or or more than that. Uh, a, a three thousand dollars on a car loan. Okay. Do you think that you're going to have pretty consistent income going forward? I just had my 15 year anniversary on last Friday. Oh, good. Okay. Yes. And will there be a pension benefit? Private company. Just uh, all I have is the uh, 401. Okay. Have you gone out and researched the new mortgage rates? Lightly. Okay. So, Mark, can you give me what a $145,000 mortgage would be at 5.3% right now for a 30-year fixed for Dave. That's what I want to see. And we're going to see what your principal and interest payment would be based on that, because that's the prevailing rate. So obviously, four and seven eighths, 4.875 is cheap. You know, you'd be paying a half a point, but you you know, if we could get you into a mortgage at 5.3% right this second and, and have a fixed rate mortgage, you never have to adjust, you don't have to worry about anything, that might give you a little peace of mind. So, Mark, do you have a, what is 145 at 5.3? Just about $800. So, what are you paying now for your mortgage, Dave? Uh, with taxes and... Uh, Homeowners. Uh, let's, I think it just went up to about 12 25 do you know what your taxes are? You don't know. You don't have it split out. Like if it's twelve twenty five, do you think that's like four hundred of that is taxes and homeowners? Interest five ninety one. Principal two forty nine. Hey, eight forty. Unbelievable. Okay, here's what we got, Dave. Right now, your principal and interest is eight hundred forty dollars a month, and if we to, were to refi right this second, it would be eight hundred dollars a month or so. So it would be the same payment as now. And if you have a payment at this level, do you feel comfortable? You feel like you can make this work? You feel like, okay, I can pay my bills. I can do everything. Then we're good. So I would look at refinancing this house right now because I don't think you can afford to wait because I think you have a bigger risk in rates jumping on you than rates going down. And if you roll the dice, you're definitely going to pay more next year. Um, the question is whether after that rates will go down. You may have another chance to refinance in some years, but if we knew that you could fix this rate right now, you would be set. You would be able to pay for this. And so here's what I would suggest. Go out and search for a more a new mortgage, and you know I would talk to. Do you have the current mortgage with a, a big bank or a local credit union? Wh which one is it with? Well, yeah, I would look and see if they want to give you a fixed rate and see if what they would charge you. 
might be cheaper to do it that way. But if you get a $145,000 mortgage at 5.3%, you are going to basically have the exact same payment. The reason why we want it to be fixed for 30 years is that if you go down to a 20 year or a 15 year, your payment will jump up and you won't have free cash flow. So you need cash flow right now until we get this 10 year old to college. Like we really just need, we really, really need you to have as much cash as possible because we know that, you know, at least for say five or six years, there's going to be $700 a month. Maybe it'll be three fifty dollars after your older daughter is done with college. Did you plan on sending these kids to college? What do you think? Uh, I haven't decided. I kind of need to let them tell me what they want to do. I had that same freedom. Here's what I think. You can't pay for college. That's what I know. Because you have a house, but you need to save more for retirement. We'll get back to Dave in just a second. If you've got a question, go to jillonmoney.com and click the Contact Us button. We'll be right back. Do I invest here? Should I put my money there? Jill Schlesinger can help you. Back to Jill on Money. You're back. It's Jill on Money, and we are returning to Dave from Pennsylvania about a mortgage question. So what I'm seeing is this. Here's like the steps in the process. Go out and talk to your, when we get done, you're going to call up your current lender and say, I'm at four and seven eighths. I want to, what would you charge me for a 30 year fixed rate mortgage with no points? Make sure you say no points. Okay. Okay. And then you're going to go and ask, go out to like a morgue, any, any other like a mortgage broker and see if they can get you something better. But you would give the bank the first shot because they'll often be cheaper. Then- once you get this mortgage fixed, you're going to take a deep breath and we're going to try to rebuild some of your savings. The first thing that I want to do is get rid of the car loan. That'll go away eventually. When? How much more time left on the car loan? Two years. Okay. So that'll be gone. That's good. But we want you to have a bigger cash cushion. We want you to have at least six months of your expenses that are in the bank. And then once you have that, what do you think you spend? I mean, you're saying 700 a month. You've got... Uh, 1200 here. This What do you figure you spend every month? Four grand? Does that sound about that, right? That sounds about right. Yeah. So if it's four grand a month, we really would like you to have more like, you know, let's say 25 grand in savings. Like, so you'll get rid of the car loan. You build up your savings. You get 25 grand in there. Once you have your 25 grand, you have no car loan. Then we're going to start to increase the amount of money you put into your retirement account. And that amount, you'll have to see kind of what the other demands will be on your cash flow, but you could put more money in there. You can put up, you know, you can put like 20, you can basically double the amount of money you're putting away. But once we get this mortgage fixed, it's going to alleviate the pressure that you're going to feel of the unknown. It doesn't mean that this is the lowest rate you'll ever have. It just means that we want you to not sweat it. You'll stay in your house. You know you can afford it right now. And I think that'll be make you feel better. Look, the other thing is that around the, the non-formal child support, I just think you have to be very careful that you are not putting so much money out there that you're shortchanging your own financial security. Okay. Understood. Uh, that that was done in such a way that we would uh, we stayed away from courts because all that money that goes into that is just taken away from the kids. That was the, oh yeah. We agreed to that. So all right. Well, so I'm sorry you went through a crapo divorce, but Mark, know. what else am I forgetting? Oh, do you have life insurance on your life? Like, if you were to drop dead, what happens? What does the ex get? That's an excellent question on what the ex gets. I don't think the ex, ex gets anything. Well, how's she, how's she going to afford to raise these kids without money? Great question, but not my problem. I'm dead. Okay. All right. All right. You still have the kids, though. It's about. It's not about her. It's about the kids. It's about the kids, right? So, like, all I'm saying to you is right now, listen to me. How much life insurance do you have through work? Uh, enough to pay off the house, 150. Okay. And then if – so, again, your kids are – they're minors still. So, do you have a will? 
I don't think so. Not not yeah. one that would not not a legally binding. Okay, one. we need you to actually do this. Who's the beneficiary on the policy? It's got to be someone, right? Is it the kids who are the beneficiaries? I'd have to download it and look to see what I did after the divorce. Okay, so here's what, what you have to do. While. This is the one thing about divorce that actually is good to have lawyers for, which is we want to make sure. I presume that if you were to drop dead, your wife is your ex wife is going to be raising these kids, right? I hope so. Okay, so. If that's the case and she, I mean, do you have full custody? Split 50-50. Okay. So, I mean, if something were to happen to you and you had no will, your wife would absolutely be the guardian of these kids. The question is, should she be the beneficiary of your life insurance policy so that she could either move back into the house sell the house. I mean, you have to make, there has to be some sort of accounting for, you know, it's something, and it is a high probability that this is completely unnecessary. If something bad happens to you, we've got to make sure your kids are taken care of. And if your wife is the kind of person, your ex-wife is a kind of person who's not going to be good with money, then you've got to make some sort of accommodation for taking care of the kids so that your wife doesn't plow through all the money with her next boyfriend. Trust fund? Right? Well, trust fund is sort of a funny word, but it's the money would be in trust and someone would have to oversee it. Do you have a sibling that you trust? Do you have someone in your life who can make sure that, you know, everything's kosher with the handling of the finances? I do, but let's say I didn't. How would I third party that? What would you do for that? Um, well, you can name an institution, the financial overseer. Like you could say to a bank. I need you or a trust company to say like, I need you to make sure my ex doesn't plow through the money and that there's a beneficiary. It's better if it's a human being. It really is. It's better if there's like somebody in your life, like a brother, a sister, a dear friend. It can be anybody who is going to be able to say, yes, Dave's ex, you have custody of these children. I control the money. And so that, who's, the, who's the beneficiary? My, my brother. So the kids, sister, the or? kids are the, the kids are the beneficiaries. And you have somebody who is assigned the financial responsibility of managing the assets on their behalf. So you got to see a lawyer. <laughs> Thanks. I'm sorry, see that? Mark, the poor guy, he's like, I got away with not having a lawyer. This you need a lawyer for. This you cannot do with an online. You, you have to have a lawyer do this. And it has to be an estate lawyer. Can't be like, oh, the guy who did my real estate closing. No. Otherwise, I think you're in good shape because I think that you're rebuilding and we're in rebuilding mode and you're going to work for a while. We're going to get these kids grown. You're going to be fine, but let's take the right precautions. Okay. Question for you, Jill. Yes, sir. Why are you talking me out of a 15 year mortgage? Because how am I going to, because if you have a 15 year mortgage, okay, your cash flow is going to be terrible. So instead of your $800 a month that you're paying, you're paying $840 now. Instead of going to 800 a month, your payment is going to be, I don't know, just for the principal and interest. Mark, you want to do a 15-year for principal of intre- and interest of 145 at- About 1200 Now you would have to pay $1,200 a month in principal and interest, so an extra $400 a month. I don't see that you have $400 a month of leeway right now. Because you want me to build up the nest bag. Yes. Let me put in a lower rate because I'll get a lower rate. So what do you think the rate would be? Four. Uh, four and a half, four, six. Yeah, that's 1100. 1100. Okay. So the reason is that first of all, we don't know what's going to happen with your kids. We don't know. I mean, if you said to me, if you said, if you had no child support going out to the ex, okay. And you wanted to do a 15 year, I'd still say it's a bad idea. We want you to have flexibility. And right now we need that extra cash flow to build up your savings and put more money in retirement. You only have 50 grand in retirement. So we need you to actually get that number up. I'm going to want you to put $20,000 a year into retirement eventually in a few years when we get, you know, when we get through some of this, this other stuff, unless you're going to be making a lot more money going forward, then, you know, we really need your cash flow. You can pay your mortgage down. Let's say it's 10 years from now and you're like, you know what, Jill, life's good. Everything's done. I want to pay my mortgage off early. Fine. But we still need that, especially in this next 10 years when your youngest, we've got to get that youngest kid up, out, and launched, and either in college or something else. And we need the money to be able to do that. 
Yeah, I, I always thought paying off the mortgage was the goal. It, it is to some people, but not for me, because you pay that mortgage off and you have no money to put into savings. Something bad happens and then all of a sudden you're in debt or you're forced to sell your house at the wrong time. Absolutely not. Remember, I mean, you can pay your mortgage down early, but right now you need that extra four hundred, three, four hundred dollars a month. You need it. You're not living. You're not so flush. If you if you had a ton of extra cash flow, it might be different. But I don't think you have that. Think of it this way. You're giving yourself the opportunity to fund different things. It could be college. It could be your own retirement. It could be just an emergency reserve fund. You need that flexibility. You must have that. And without having a longer term, we are stretching your payments out and you're going to get an advantage. You're going to get a tax benefit from that. But you know, what is most important is that we've got to give you options. And if all that money is going to pay down the house, then you won't have the options. If you've got a refi question, an arm question, just head on over to jillonmoney.com and let us know how we can help you out. While you're there, sign up for the free newsletter. It comes out every Friday. It's a good prep for the show. Okay, we'll be right back. K's, IRAs, refinancing, she covers it all. Back to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. You're back. It's Jill on Money, the program that tries to take the mystery out of your financial life. If you've got a question, all you need to do is head on over to the website, jillonmoney.com, and click the Contact Us button. That is what Peter did. Peter is on the line from New Jersey. What brings you to us and how can we help you out? Well, I'll tell you, my wife and I would like to get both of your opinions on our financial affairs as we approach retirement age. Okay. How old are you, Peter? I will be 64 in October. Okay. Wife? My wife will be 60, uh, is 61 right now. She'll be 62 in March. She considers retiring at 65. I have no plans. Are you both working for companies? Are you self-employed? Do you work together? What's your story? I work for a company and my wife is self-employed. She's a 1099 independent contractor. Okay. And how much does she make? The 1099 in 2021 was 118000 Projected 2022, 125000 Great. Awesome. Does she make retirement contributions into her own retirement plan on that money? Yes, Jill, she does have a SEP and she contributes approximately $5,200 annually. And how much do you earn, Peter? 2021 was 149000 anticipated 2022, 185000 Ooh, that's a nice jump. Yeah, you know, yeah, yes, I'm well compensated. That's great. Okay, and from that income, that one eighty five for this year, are you making contributions into a retirement plan for yourself? I do. I con I contribute ten uh, percent right now to our company four hundred one k. Okay, and traditional or a Roth are you using? It's traditional. We don't have the Roth option yet. I've been asking for that, but we have do not have that option yet. How much money is in your four hundred one k total? Total on uh, my four hundred one k is uh, five hundred and eighty thousand dollars in my four hundred one k. And your wife's SEP? My wife's SEP is $86,000. Okay, good. Any other retirement accounts, old ones kicking around? Anything yes. else you got? Yes. Okay, so uh, I have a traditional IRA. Yesterday's value, 142000 We have traditional inherited IRAs on my wife's end of $353,000. Uh, just when did that person die? What year? Um like 10 years ago. Or okay. So, yeah, so, so she's you're... already taking required minimum distributions on that. Okay. So she's able to do the stretch IRA, which is yes. good. Yeah. Okay, great. What other assets are I there? Have, I also have $15,000 in a 401k at my job that is managed by a census. How do you pay your Merrill Lynch advisor? He takes his compensation right online uh, out of my statements. So is it like a 1% charge? Is it a, is it commission? Do you know? Yes. It's, I pay a reasonable, I think reasonable, uh, 0.75% advisory fee. Okay. That's good. And so he has 
the traditional IRA, the inherited IRA, and the SEP IRA. He has everything that we own other than our checking account, and I'm not sure I'm doing the right thing. Okay. Well, what do you mean? He can't, he, is he taking a management fee on your retirement account on your, um, 180 on your, um, on your 401k? Yes. It's, it's self-directed. Okay. And how about money in emergency reserve fund? Um, uh, $25,000 cash. Okay. How about your house? How much is it worth? House is worth approximately 750 to 800,000. Is there a mortgage that remains? There is no mortgage, but there is a $142,000 HELOC. What's that for? My wife and I got very generous when our two sons graduated from college. To oh, good Lord. Lord. Here we go. So, uh, we helped them out, not knowing that they were going to get a job, and now they have wonderful jobs. You know, and we did some home improvements, but nothing nothing extravagant. How old are the kids now? They're adults and well, launched? Uh, both adults, 25 and 27. Have they offered to help pay down that HELOC after all that help you gave them? Uh, they have not offered, nor Shocking. have I asked. I know. I'm just, I'm making fun. Of course yeah, they didn't no, offer. And, they, and they're going to hear this, so that's okay. That's okay. That's, it's good. It's good right. for them, especially if they have good jobs. Yes. You know, let's talk a little bit about what you're thinking around your retirement. Are either of you going you, to be entitled to any pension benefits from yeah. old employers? There are no pension benefits. Tell us about your social security. So give us at social security, full retirement age. Okay. What's your benefit and what's her benefit? My full retirement will be 3180. And if my wife holds true to her plans and retires at 65, her social security would be 2608. But we wouldn't, we would still have her wait till her full retirement age. Do you know what that number is? I, you know, I don't know that. I, that's I, at, I, but that so that's at 65, that, yes. that 26. Okay. That's correct. How much money do you guys need to live on? I'm going to give you the same number that I gave our Merrill Lynch broker about five months ago when he did a, a projection for us. I'm going to say $10,000 a month. And that includes travel and everything. That includes everything. Okay. At this point, do you have any any idea about... You said, you know, you, you're going to hopefully retire whenever you retire, but are you really thinking about retirement in like three years or five years? Like what's the most likely scenario for you? Uh, let me start by saying I, I love what I do. I'm five miles from home and I could work till I could work till I'm 70. So I'm not looking to stop working. I just, I just love what I do and I, I, need, I need to do something. I'm very fortunate. Okay. So I'm not that concerned then, theoretically, I'm just like putting this out there that essentially, if your wife said in four years, and she wants to retire when she's 65, you guys would not really need for her to claim her social security at that point, because you hopefully will still be working, right? Yes, that's correct. Okay, that's good. Because I don't want her to claim early at all. I definitely don't want her to claim early. So now when I look at the numbers, I'm, you know, you need 10 grand a month. You're probably, if we wait for her full retirement, do you happen to have your social security estimate at age 70? It was closer to 4000 about $4,000. Yeah. Okay. That's great. So if you think about it, like if you're wait till you're 70 and then we don't have to like dip into your money, you don't have to keep putting money into retirement, by the way. That that's actually not what I would suggest right now. The most important thing for you guys to do between, you know, sort of in the next six years is to build up some money that's already been taxed because you have a lot of money that is pre-tax. There's no way to make that go away right now. We'll get back to Peter in just a moment. If you need help, just give us a holler, jillonmoney.com and click the contact us button. We'll be right back. Follow Jill on Twitter and Instagram for more personal finance content. Just use the handle at Jill on Money. Now, back to the show. Jill. 
You are back. It's Jill on Money. And you know, every week we field your questions, we answer them to the best of our ability, and we really want to try to hold your hand on wherever your financial journey leads you. But I know, and we all know, that some people need a little bit more than a contact with a radio show or a podcast. And if that feels like you, I've got some great news. Our sponsor, Facet Wealth, actually creates financial plans that really help you enrich your entire life. This is unbiased human beings that takes into account all that you are. And there's great news for you guys, because if you visit cbsaudio.com slash Jill, you'll get two months free off your first year of financial planning. So go check them out right now. We are on the line with Peter from New Jersey. So Mark, do you agree that we should like start building up that cash reserve in anticipation of, you know, his wife going to kind of retire at 65. So we lose her income, but that until that time, you know, if, if he's making 185 and she's making 125, we put in up to the match for say his retirement account, but then start stockpiling a brokerage account. Do you agree with that, Mark? Yeah. I was going to say, just get the match. Yeah, let's get the match and not worry. And then let's build up that brokerage account. The question really is, you know, do you want to keep working with this broker or not? 0.75 is not terrible. It really isn't. It's just a drag that like, I mean, do you feel comfortable doing it yourself? Not to minimize the the title and the job. I, I don't believe it's rocket scientists and I can do it. I, I, I did it before I had a broker. Okay. It isn't rocket science and I've done it for a living. It really isn't. You know, part of what I think about when I was really the best at doing my job as a as a certified financial planner, as a money manager and a, a planner, is that I was there to walk through the same thing I walk think walking through with you. It's like I'm talking this through with people. And the real reason I think I had value was to kind of look forward and do a lot of projections. So here's what I'm gonna guess that you're the the dude at Merrill Lynch said, You're fine. Because you're going to have money coming in. And as long as you're working till you're age 70, you're going to have plenty of money. And, you know, at that moment, you're going to start pulling money out of these accounts and you'll be OK. Is that what he said? Exactly. But how do you feel about extricating yourself from this person? Like, I, how are we going to uh, do that? You know, I'm, I'm an emotional guy, so I'm, I'm emotionally attached because I, I just am. You know, we're friends, kind of. And um I, I would I would peel something away and I would ask you what I should peel away first. Well, tell me, where is the retirement plan held? The current your current 401k, where is that held? It's managed by a census and that money gets transferred to uh, Merrill Lynch. But if you if it were in a census and you just had could you just pick, you know, mutual funds or index funds? Yes. Yes. You know, if you have a menu of, of index funds that through a, a census that you can use, that's what I would start with because okay. that's the biggest chunk of your money anyway. That's the three hundred, that five hundred eighty grand. That to me is like now we put that together. Now we have five eighty plus the fifteen. So let's just call it you have six hundred grand. Let's start with that. And you say to him, you know what? I want to manage this. I really do. I feel comfortable with it. You can keep the traditional IRA. You can keep the inherited IRA. You can keep the SEP IRA, but I want to do this myself. And he's going to flip on you just to be honest with you, but be very clear. I love you. You've been great to me. It's been fun. I really want to do this myself. And if I can't do it, and if I find myself that like, it's too much for me, or, you know, if God forbid I drop dead and my wife doesn't want to do it, she'll have you manage it. Like you're still in our lives. How's that? Perfect. I think that's easy to do. Now, the one thing is he might crank your fee on you. He might say to you, well, you know, I have you in at, at 0.75 because you got more than a million bucks here. He might say that. And then you just say, well, tell me what the fee is going to be and I'll make a decision. Maybe I'll do, maybe I'll move everything out. Maybe, I'll, you know, like that, that's going to be another conversation point. I think that, listen, when I was on the other end of those conversations, it sucks. Okay. As the person who was the money manager and got that call, it's a, it really is a bummer. But the reality is it's become easier and easier to manage money. And if you're comfortable with it, then I think it's fair to say to this person, look, it's been great. And he's made a lot of money from you and you're not breaking up and totally, you might, you're saying, literally saying, I want to try this. And if it doesn't work, I'm coming back to you with my hat in my hand. Very good. What about estate documents? All done? Estate planning is done. Will, advance, directive, power of attorney. 
Okay, let me just have a little message to Peter's sons who are listening. Peter, you got your sons to listen, which I love. They will listen. Do they have any college loans? Uh, one doesn't. One has a few, th- a couple of thousand dollars, under five thousand dollars left. So, guys, your folks did a lot of nice things for you. You know, it would be a really great gesture, and for any young people listening, is to at least offer, "Hey, you know what, mom, dad." We're making money. How about we send you 300 bucks a month until further notice, until, you know, we help whittle down your HELOC. Wouldn't that be a nice offer to make? Because 300 is not a terrible amount. 300 is like, that's a number that's like a real number, but it shouldn't, I don't know how much they make, but if they've got jobs and life is good, I would just, sons, children, offspring, give that a whirl. Dad and mom would really appreciate it. And it shows that you're actually a financial grown up. Okay, if you, like Peter, need a second opinion, we're here for you. That's what we do. Mark and I are both CFPs. So just go to JillOnMoney.com, click the Contact Us button, and let us know if you'd be willing to come on the air. While you're there, you can pre-order the new book. It's called The Great Money Reset. Change your work, change your wealth, change your life. Who doesn't want that? We'll be right back. You're back. It's Jill on Money, the program that attempts to take the mystery out of your financial life. I'm Jill Schlesinger. It's the end of the program, and we're going to try to pick up with an email from one of you folks. It's William who says, we want to move to be closer to our niece in Virginia now that we're retired in our late 60s. We also want to pay cash for our new home to avoid a mortgage. It's more expensive there, so we need to pull $220,000 out of an IRA to make this happen. We've got $2.2 million in assets. It's comprised of IRAs, Roth IRAs, 403Bs, and savings. Plus, we have more than enough money from my Social Security and annuities to cover our monthly expenses. And we're going to have even more when my wife starts her Social Security in three years. Is this a doable move for us? Well, you know, look, I don't know what the composition is. If you've got a ton of money in IRAs already or 403Bs, I I guess that you could pull the money out, pay the tax and move on. Uh, It's just a bummer to pay all that tax. That said, it is one way to get a bunch of money out of the pre-tax environment before your tax bracket pops up from your wife's social security. One issue just to make sure you're covering is that you want to leave yourself with ample liquidity in the savings. So that's why I don't want you to just pull the money out of the savings. It's really important that, especially as you get older, you've got a nice one to two years in the bank, even if you do have sufficient income. But overall, it sounds like it's pretty doable. So uh, if you've got follow-up questions, let me know. Okay, that's it. That is the program. We are always so grateful that you come back week after week. Don't forget, all the stuff that we produce lives on our website, jillonmoney.com. It's also where you can click the contact button and ask your question. While you're on the website, you can also subscribe to our podcast, both the Jill on Money and I on Money shows. Check them out. Our music is composed by Joel Goodman. Mark Talercio is our executive producer. Put your hands metaphorically on someone's back. Thanks for listening, and we will talk to you next week.